It is a windy day in November, toward the end of November. I believe it's the 29th, 2005, just a few weeks before Christmas. Coming up the north way, my wife's little car <laughs> wanted to make its own path along the side. What a day. Yeah, and David Patrick's here. You came from Colchester today? Yeah, Colchester, Vermont. I uh, drove up 89, and, and you're right, it was very windy. It's um, amazing. We're expecting... I mean, the weather forecasters are really drawing this picture of gloom and doom for everywhere from the Carolinas all the way up through. I don't know what we're going to end up with today, not that it matters when this is shown many months hence, but uh, high winds, lots of rain, very little snow on the ground this year. Uh, but we made it, both yeah, of us. both of us at the same time. How are you, David? Very good. It's, it's great to see you. It's been several years since yeah. we sat at this table. Yeah, I think it was uh, August of 2002 when we... Uh, talk last. I think it was important to mark that occasion for a couple of reasons. First of all, I met you for the first time. You're a very bright guy, wonderful historian. And secondly, I think that's the heaviest book I ever lifted yeah, in it was my a, life. <laughs> the, the, as some people probably know I worked on a, uh, I was compiling a genealogy of uh, information found at the McClellan Collection at the Feinberg Library Special Collections. And I started in 1995 and it covers basically um, my whole family from the Champlain side, uh, the McClellans, the Moores, the Nyes. And I spent quite a bit of time putting it together. And, Which is an uh, understatement because yeah. we know you spent thousands of hours. Probably about 5,000 hours. Wow. Uh, you know, very, uh, probably an underestimate. And put it together and that's when I, I talked to you when I was uh, um, showing it off. So it was a... Uh, um, printed out a few copies and so I had this uh, huge book of material and and that's um, what I was trying to do is start working with other projects from that wonderful piece of history though. yeah great photographs great information and for you I know you were exhausted but satisfied when that whole thing was finished. yeah it was actually many many months of uh, editing re-editing printing it um, you know, adding more material, thinking you were done, and then you'd add more material. And of course, you never really are done. And, you know, it's just an amount of, uh, amount of continuing adding more material. And since we talked in 2002, um, I've, you know, put together a lot more information. And that's just waiting to be intertwined with the bigger document. Oh, um, no. Yeah. So it's, it's even going to be fatter than it was? Yeah, it's a lot of work, but it's... Oh, uh, so you're going to put out a second edition, maybe? Probably uh, at some point. Um, but what I decided to do in the meantime was in the bigger book that I had, um, I had collected a huge amount of information um, related to Champlain Village, mostly the village of Champlain that was collected by... Uh, my relative Hugh McClellan, um, also uh, his son Woody McClellan had collected material too. And I decided I needed to get this material out to the general public uh, in a mass produced form. And uh, I had about 900 photographs in the bigger book that I had scanned and edited and uh, a huge amount of material uh, in the book on different subjects, uh, the founding of the town of Champlain, village of Champlain, um, the, the Presbyterian Church, the schools, uh, Plenty More survey of the Morrisville Grant, etc. And what I wanted to do was to get this out in a professional form. And uh, one day I had the idea of a historic calendar. And uh, I talked, Ta -da! yeah. And I, I talked with uh, Celine Paquette. I asked her. I said, "Do you think a calendar like that would sell up in Champlain?" And she thought it was a great idea. So uh, it was, you know, I got permission from the school, um, which owned probably most of the photographs, and uh, continued, uh, you know, working on that. And uh, you know, when I got permission, I basically sat down and started putting a calendar together. So you've done how many, four so far? I've done four. Uh, as you know, we had this interview in 2002. That's when I was finished with a book. And probably around summer of 2002, I had the idea for the calendar. So my first calendar was the, uh, the 2003 uh, calendar. And it's actually evolved quite a bit since then. Um, got quite a, bit, quite a uh, bit of good feedback from the calendars. Uh, 
the first calendar That's a great idea calendars yeah. are a good idea well they're they're good in that you know you can put together uh pictures and people like pictures and especially old pictures we've found that yeah <laughs> over and the years we yeah. found that out people love old pictures yeah i mean these are not none of these pictures are you know taken recently they're probably about 100 years old you know 1880s to 1910 and the special collections at the Feinberg Library um, has several thousand uh, prints that were in the McClellan collection. And I've actually scanned quite a few of those, as you could probably imagine, and uh, had edited them. And also I found about a couple hundred, 600 maybe max uh, glass plate negatives that were collected by the McClellans. Uh, some were of family members you know, they were taken by the McClellans between 1881 and uh, 19, well, the glass plates were probably 1920s, 1930s. Um, so over the years, uh, maybe three, four or five years, I was getting 20 or 30 at a time reprinted um, from the original glass plates. Uh, and they're pretty good photographs, yeah, too. That's the best yeah, part of it. These aren't 100-year-old faded prints yeah. that have been, you know, bent and have spots on them and all that these are the original glass plates you know that sometimes they're four by fives other times they're you know eight by tens and i had a printer in plattsburgh print them contact prints and on good paper and the quality is superb and i would print them and scan them into the computer and spend probably about an hour per photo uh, editing the, the pictures, you know, getting the dust and scratches and out and, it, you, you know, making the contrast better. And it's amazing what, you know, digital, you know, technology can do to, to photographs. What a boon that's been. And we've done interviews with several people who have self-published historical books yeah. about the North Country, mining industry, railroads, and so on. And once you get proficient at working with, uh, uh, with digital, digital equipment, you can really make some nice stuff, can't you? Yeah, I mean, all you need is a uh, scanner, a good scanner, and, uh, you know, a digi digital imaging software, you know, uh, and th those are the two items that you really need. And so I had put all this together. Um, I had the photographs scanned. I had um, the, the paper material. And so I, st I started putting, choosing photographs and uh, putting together the, the calendar. And, you know, then in the calendar, I also went through and uh, for each day of the, uh, or, you know, each month, I went through my bigger book, which was all digitized. It's on the computer. And you could look for, uh, you know, February, March, April, and you could pick out dates from that. And so I was able to find a lot of specific events that happened on certain days. What a neat thing. We're yeah. going to talk about these calendars, 2003, 4, 5, and yeah. now 2006 as we come back to talk to David Patrick. Stay with us. This is a good format to present history to people. Yeah. Um, you know, for years we've tried to get the local populace interested in the history of their communities. What you've done for the people in Champlain is phenomenal. Yeah. Other people have worked behind the scenes, but now, what a great idea. Everybody needs a calendar. Yeah, and you know, again, as I said before, people like pictures, you know, looking at what Champlain used to be. I mean, Champlain was a very, it's a very vibrant town, and um, you know, there was a lot of buildings that aren't present today. And you know, you can see an open lot, for example, and say, what was there before? And a lot of people may not know what was there. Um, uh, you may see a building present today, but you know when was that building built? And the reality is, a lot of buildings that are present in Champlain today, the village, um, were not around in the early 1800s. And there's other buildings that were there. And uh, these photographs uh, show people what the buildings, you know, were present, what they used to look like. Um, what the streets used to look like and it's kind of amazing to see how some buildings have changed over the years quite considerably and other buildings uh, haven't even uh, changed at all I mean maybe the color of the paint has changed but it's the same facade the same porch uh, of a building that was you know around 1900 and it's quite amazing but there's a lot of hints if you look around the village of what used to be and you just have to interpret that and obviously the pictures 
you know, help you do that. You know, if you see a stone present, um, you know, a lot of times they had uh, uh, stones where people would get out on the carriage. Um, yes. And, and there's actually stones up uh, um, on, I think, Chestnut Street, uh, where there used to be an old carriage, uh, you know, uh, entryway there. There, yeah, you can see those. If you look for those, somebody told me about one of my sons works for DOT and he was stopping by a house in Peru and he said that, that the block is still there where the carriage would pull up and the yeah. people would get out. And I said, you know, us old guys are familiar with seeing things like that, but young people would drive by and have no clue what that was all exactly. about. Exactly. And for example, the, villa, the Main Street um, has changed dramatically. I mean, the biggest problem, of course, has been the fires that have plagued it for years. I mean, I got pictures of the, you know, from the 1920s and on, uh, where one by one, each building just seems to disappear and, and now it's either replaced by an empty lot or another building. But in all the buildings, there was, you know, downtown Main Street was lined by buildings on both sides uh, of the bridges. And, you know, a lot of those buildings are gone. And of course, the floods have made it even worse, you know, with, uh, you know, the buyouts, you know, the FEMA buyouts. Um, but also, uh, back in the late 1800s, uh, Main Street was lined by, uh, by trees, probably elm trees, and, you know, just dotted the street. And that's, that's all gone today. You know, the funny part of it is, um, I wrote a column a short time back on tree houses. And when people of my age were young, they always went out in the woods and put some boards up in a tree and at tree houses or, or in their backyard. But there are far less trees in communities yeah. than there were back then, and you just underlined that. See, that's true of almost any village or town you can think about, in Champlain especially. Yeah. I mean, you can see, like, in the, in the, in the 2003 photo of Champlain um, that someone had planted trees probably in the 18... 40s, 1850s along Main Street in, in defined spots. And, you know, by 1900, 1905, these are, you know, 40, 50 foot trees. And there are probably elm trees, which of course, you know, probably, you know, died over the years. Interesting, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. So, you know, I basically, let me just say, I, I had a lot of material, a lot of photographs, a lot of uh, written material, and um, I decided to put together the calendars and they've actually done quite well better than I, I figured I'd just do one and see how it would uh, what the response would be and you know it was phenomenal I mean I printed 250 calendars the first year and more or less sold out and I heard people were buying five and ten at a time um, and it was it was almost like a collector's item <laughs> And that well, that's wonderful. And yeah. 50 years from now, it will be a collector's item. Oh yeah, I I think it's going to be you know, uh, you know, people are going to see these pictures here, and it's probably going to be one of the only sources of the uh, pictures out there. You know, of of the of this uh, from this collection, and it's uh, you know the photography the the printing process is photo quality, so these aren't uh, Xerox copies of of uh, pictures, these are photo quality pictures. I mean, the, the detail is superb. And I spent a lot of time uh, working with the uh, the printer to get the best quality I could this get. Is this a local printer? Yeah, Border Press and Rouse's oh, Point. Oh, of course. Yeah. We've been there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we've been there, we've done they that. They do a really good job. Um, oh. I, I scan the photographs, I do all the uh, typing, edits, etc., and they basically, uh, um, cut and paste it into their publishing program and do the, the fine-tuning and, and print it. You know, many years ago, if you had tackled this project, you wouldn't have had nearly the tools you have now, all the digital machinery, yeah. but you wouldn't have the local printing facilities. There are only one or two in the area. Now there are several who are qualified to do this kind of work, and that makes it really good for somebody like you Yeah, and good for somebody like them yeah. You hand them the finished product and yeah. they crank it out. And, and what's uh, ironic about the whole uh, uh, this whole situation is uh, the Border Press actually bought um, the Morrisfield Press, which my relatives used to use to print the same material. Isn't between, that cool? Between Isn't 19, that neat? Yeah, between 1919 and 1980s, and uh, I, I didn't know it until I went there for the first time, and and I could see the old press and the old typeset, you know, in the back room. 
and uh, and I could hear stories of, um, from Jim Rochester, the owner, of him working with Woody McClellan, and and uh, so, and you know stories about that and about the presses and stuff. So, um, what my relatives had been doing. 50 years ago, 70 years ago, um, uh, the Rochesters are doing now uh, with me. You know, uh, that's that's one of the neat programs that we've done, and, and Calvin's done hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, and I've done a few hundred with him since 1997. But inside, to, to get an inside view of Border Press, that was so cool to see the first of the of the comic books that Calvin uh, has been producing over the last couple of years, and then recently they did a nice article in the newspaper yeah, the Tom Tyler. Uh, about the Tom Tyler tales. And it's, it's great to, ch to look at the history of another town. Yeah. Now, I have no direct connection with Champlain except meeting people like you and, and, and hundreds of others who live from that area. But I'm interested in the old, just as interested in the old pictures as somebody who might be a native there. Yeah. I love to look at the old pictures, and a calendar is a wonderful way to do it. And it, and it shows how people lived in, in the old days. I mean, you know, um, for example, there's pictures of cars, people driving in the winter in cars. None of these cars had enclosed um, cabs. They were all open, and you had to crank the, uh, the starter in the front. Um, obviously, no heat. And you see people sitting in chairs, uh, and that's what my 2006 calendar shows. Some people, probably November, December, just sitting in an open uh, cab. You know, it's amazing how people lived back then. It was covered with the buffalo robes, and in the springtime, and the deep mud, and yeah. the, the whole nine yards. I think we've pretty well uh, defined it by now. But I just, before we actually turn the calendar over and show people some of this wonderful work you've done, I want to I want to underline further what your direct connection is with Champlain. Okay. Because I we know you live in in Colchester, Vermont yeah. now. Yeah. Um, I I actually grew up in Plattsburgh, born and raised in Plattsburgh. That's where my my family is from. Um, my ancestor Plenty Moore um, was the first English settler uh, to come to Champlain. He fought in the Revolutionary War, and. Um, 1785, um, he came up here. He received a land grant. Uh, it was called the Morrisville Grant, and from the state of New York for serving in the Revolution. And he was allocated a certain amount of land uh, based on his rank. He came up here three times: 85, 86, and I think 87, and uh, laid out 119 lots and uh, ended up owning about 40 of those lots. They're about 100 acres each, and basically in the village of Champlain. And he, in 1789, he moved up here, st settled his family with uh, six other people, um, and became the first judge, postmaster, uh, first everything. You know, it's, you know when, you're th when you're the first person, sure. it's easy to, be, to do that. And uh, he built where what the, looks like it's not the original house, but it's the house where the Clark Funeral Home is in Champlain. Um, the house that you see now today is an exact reproduction of the house that he built in 1801. And so he lived there all his life. Uh, he died 1822. Um, he's, my, he's my ancestor. Um, his son was uh, Noah Dyer Moore, um, who was uh, quite well known in, in uh, I think, the Underground Railroad of, of that time. And uh, uh, he was a merchant, too, a mill owner. And then uh, his daughter married uh, Bartlett Nye. Bartlett Nye built what was the Savoy Building, uh, which burned down uh, two years ago, the big mansion. And he was a merchant in Champlain, too. And he would be my great, 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 great grandfather. And so, <laughs> I'll make and sure then, you get enough greats yeah, in there. Yeah, a lot of greats. So then yeah. the Nyes married, the McClellans married the Nyes. And uh, um, my grandmother was a McClellan, was Betty. Uh, Betty McClellan, and uh, so um, you know that's how I'm related to to that. Now, uh, my grandmother's uncle was uh, Hugh McClellan, and her cousin was Woody McClellan. And Hugh McClellan, um, even though he lived in Long Island, he retired um, in Champlain and made it his summer summer home. But in 1919, he came up here and established the Morrisville Press and started collecting all the Plenty More papers and Champlain material 
for about 50 years, and he did the uh, cemetery transcriptions, which are at the Special Collections and at the Public Library, which is probably most well known as the McClellan Collection, cemetery records. And so he spent about 50 years collecting this material, and it went to his son, Woody, and uh, Woody McClellan in the early 80s donated it to the College Foundation, Plattsburgh College Foundation, which in turn gave it to the uh, Special Collections Library, which is where it's housed. And so, so my connection basically to Champlain is uh, through the, you know, my ancestors uh, that, have, that have lived there. Um, I always had an interest in genealogy and I started working on this as a genealogy project. And over the years, because of so much, you know, uh, so much uh, everything being intertwined, you know, where the genealogy and the history work together, um, I've migrated almost to making this into a historical project and less of a genealogy project. The fact is, you cannot deny that you're driven to do these things because it's in your genes. Yeah, uh, people have said that. I. I, I kind of wonder about that. Uh, you know, you, you got to wonder about these things. But you have you were born with that yeah. predisposition toward preserving history. Yeah, I, I do have that disposition of, of trying to preserve history and, and seeing stuff and like trying to keep it uh, intact. You know, I don't I don't like seeing buildings, old buildings torn down, and uh, et cetera. So I also wanted to try to preserve what was in the collection and make sense of it. And I realized this collection at the college library was huge, 120,000 papers, uh, you know, thousands of photographs, prints, 600 glass plates. Um, and it was just a total, I don't want to say mess, but it was uh, boxes and boxes and boxes of material. And someone had to make sense of it all. And because it was, it was my ancestry, my family, I started trying to make sense of it all, and of course it's Champlain history too, and that's where the overlap is. And now I, I can say I'm almost, you know, three quarters, 90 percent uh, interested mostly in the Champlain history because that's so interesting. There's a lot of stuff out there that people just don't know because that information's been lost by, you know, you know, generations ago by, you know, from people. I mean, Hugh McClellan, uh, he was born 1874, died, died 1963. And, uh, you know, he was, he had a huge amount of material and information, you know, in him. And, and I went to his son, Woody, and, and, you know, Woody died in the 80s. And a lot of this information would have been lost forever if it hadn't been written down on paper. And, of course, you have 3,000 letters of plenty more that were typed up by Hugh over 20 years, from 1915 to 1920. Isn't it amazing? Think about it. For anybody who has any spark of interest in history. Yeah. Wow. Well, Alan Everest, in his book on Plenty More, um, which he wrote, he, he was a good friend of Woody McClellan, uh, he said this family, the McClellans, didn't throw out a piece of paper. And it's probably true. Thank God for yeah. that, right? And uh, yeah, other people have said that. And Plenty More uh, didn't either. He. Uh, Apparently, he saved all his letters. Um, he actually saved the drafts of his letters. I mean, a lot of times you don't have the, the letter that was sent to, you know, someone, you know, in another town or another state, but you have the draft that he wrote and then copied, so you know exactly what was said, and then you have the reply. And Hugh McClellan, 1915, found this in a, in a huge chest with bundles of letters uh, from... 1770s uh, to the 1820s, and he found this in, in the uh, in the in the Whiteside relative, which is where the Champlain Telephone Company is today. And that was there was a nice house there, and so every night he'd type up maybe one or two letters, and uh, he started this in 1915 and ended in 1930s. <laughs> And it's had, so cool. Yeah, had about so 3,000 cool. letters. I'm I'm glad we're spending this time to pay tribute to that family. And, and you to perpetuate it because we've done it before. But it's, these are the people who are, are the reasons for us sitting here at this table today right. without all of that wonderful stuff. And furthermore, special collections as a tremendous resource for people. You know, I spend every moment I can in defensive libraries, which yeah. are really hurting across the country for many reasons now with the internet and so on. 
But Special Collections is a wonderful resource yeah. for history, and I have sent so many people there over the years to go and check through the papers, through personal papers and maps and books. and. Yeah. It's great. So you you pulled yeah. it all together. So you worked with Special Collections. You worked with the foundation, right? Yeah, the, the foundation, College Foundation, officially owns the McClellan Collection. It was, oh, a gift. Yes. it was a gift by the McClellans to the foundation because they're the, uh, the gift part of the school. Um, so when I got permission to do the calendars, I had to get permission from the foundation. And of course, uh, you know, the, the proceeds of, of the calendar go to the foundation and I had it set up so that the money goes instead of to the general fund goes back to the college library special collections they have their own Your uh, mama didn't raise yeah fools, they, they, they have they have their own uh, account special collections so yeah. Isn't that the wonderful? money goes back to them buying uh, preservation material folders boxes computers you know a lot of stuff that people would use so their collection now uh, is actually um, helping to fund you know you know you know the collection um so that's that's good so you know the money goes to the school goes to the college and it, and then goes to the uh, library that's great yeah. and what you've done of course you've created a monster you'll never be you said it's a never-ending task and that was an understatement yeah it will never end as long as you have the energy and the passion yeah this will continue forever and ever yeah i mean every year you know it's i, I thought this would be i wasn't sure what what I was going to do, you know, after the first year, I was going to, you know, uh, see how it worked, you know, if it was, uh, people were going to have an interest in the calendar. I mean, there's not many people in Champlain, you know, 2,500 maybe. So if you're printing 250 calendars and there's 2,000 people um, and it's selling out almost all of them, that's one in 10 people in the area that have a calendar, which is a pretty good amount, you know, pretty good am amount of people. And so I did the first calendar as like a test to see how things would sell, how, what the interest would be. And when it was really good, I said, well, I'll do another one. And of course, people start to expect calendars too. And you, <laughs> of you, course you, they you do. establish a certain base of people who, you know, know about the calendar. So, it, you know, and so, and I like doing it. So every year I, I've been doing it now for four years and I'll, I'll most likely do a 2007 one. I too. should mention also that you have a day job. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And one would think job. that this takes 23 hours out of every day. Well, usually I start around uh, June or July of, of that year. And, uh, you know, it's usually I have some of the material already. I try to choose a subject and the, and the photographs. So um, I'm usually spending the summer picking out photographs and uh, choosing a subject and starting to write about that. And then by middle of September I'm, I'm more or less done by with a calendar and I, I send it to the border press and it's maybe three weeks of editing and and I've been trying to get it out in early to mid-November and you know before Thanksgiving comes out and we, we managed to do it th this year too so the calendars are out right now that's amazing yeah. and wonderful we're gonna pause for just a moment and then we're actually gonna show you pictures of the 2003 calendar right through 2006 stay with us And that is the cover for the 2003 historic calendar for the village of Champlain. How did you? How do you choose the cover of each one? Um, I have a, obviously quite a few pictures, and what I try to do is I try to choose a good quality glass plate print that anyone in the Champlain area would recognize. You know, it's not a picture of just one particular house. It's usually a street scene that you know people drive by. You know, maybe every day. And you know they would they would obviously uh, you know take a look at it and recognize it right off. So I, I try to choose it for artistic uh, um, you know composition as well as familiarity that people might have with the with the, the scene. So that's downtown. It's a wide street. It's yeah. It's, it's a it's actually Main Street looking west, and uh, it's dirt. It's a dirt road, so it's probably taken around 1900. And it uh, shows a lot of buildings, and uh, only one of the buildings in that picture is actually present. It's those two red brick buildings on the corner of Elm and Oak Street. No kidding. The other buildings Isn't have burned down amazing. over the years. And, of course, the uh, Elm trees are all gone today, and, yeah. and uh, you know, a lot of things have changed. I guess they have. 
All right, let's. Uh, I'll just pick the pages up. Calvin, take a quick shot of it, and you can tell us what we're looking yeah. at. So the first picture is uh, showing uh, Champlain Hall. Um, that picture, those buildings were built probably around 1850, and uh, uh, they held. They you know they had various things like the A and P and the Grand Union grocery stores in the you know early to mid 1900s. Uh, they had the masons in the upstairs. Um, right now, the buildings are uh, abandoned, and uh, um, they've had a lot of uh, you know damage to the floods and stuff like that. Uh, the building to the left of it, which you saw, was called Doolittle's store, and that I don't know when that building disappeared, but uh, Mr. Doolittle had was very um, well known in the town, and uh, he had a store up there, and, and there was a lot of apartments up there too. Oh, cool. So as we're recording this, we learned from Calvin that those those buildings that are shown in that first photograph are vacant, and yeah. uh, somebody can go and <laughs> buy those tomorrow morning if they want to. Yeah, the uh, you'd like to see them rehabilitated. Yeah, though. it would you know be you know a shame to see the buildings torn down because you know so many buildings in Champlain have disappeared over the years, and uh, um, you know a lot of buildings you know can be restored back to their original condition. Um, and uh, you know sh uh, the main street has seen a lot of buildings disappear due to the uh, you know fires and, and floods and all that. Well, when you live near rivers, that's what happens. Yeah, I'm I can attest to that. But I hang on to by our teeth every year and hope that we don't flood again. Yeah. What's the next one? Uh, the next photograph is taken on Oak Street, and it shows a uh, uh, a small photo stand with children standing in front of it. Probably in the early 1900s. And uh, it, it shows about three feet of snow, which is, uh, you don't At really, least three feet of snow. Yeah, you don't see too many uh, snowstorms up here like that anymore. People today think we're kidding when we talked about the snow we had. It wasn't just because we were short back then. Yeah. We had snowstorms like we don't often have them anymore. And then we heard about, you and I started this program by talking about storms in the Midwest and and in some places they got six to nine feet of snow yeah. and i guess that would even outdo some yeah. of the storms. champlain's got a lot of cold and a lot of snow yeah. over the years. a lot of areas yeah okay next um, the third photo is of march 2003 and it shows uh river street and the the floods that hit and this is pro this is march 26 1904 and a lot of people may not know it, but River Street had, which is basically parallel to uh, Elm Street in front of the Clark Funeral Home uh, where the Savoy used to be, uh, it was a street that had a lot of buildings on them. And there were, I guess, uh, um, a lot of the houses were identical. Um, and uh, there was, I don't know, maybe 20 or 30 houses on that street. And over the years, uh, for whatever reason, I don't, you know, maybe it was due to the flooding or so, um, you know, the buildings have disappeared. There's only one or two buildings on that street now um, that were present in the early 1900s. But the, the, you know, when every when the Chazy floods, the uh, that one area would definitely definitely get flooded out. There are communities in the North Country that have that problem year after year yeah. after year. I'll say Bull Forks. Uh, I know whatever. Champlain as a town has tried very hard to uh, keep the flooding to a minimum, you know, with dynamiting and et cetera. You do your best, but Mother Nature always has the last word. All right, yeah. what's next? Um, the next one is uh, Champlain House, and that was... Not, not with uh, oh, <laughs> what did I do? Flip two pages? Two pages. <laughs> Okay, you is uh, April 2003. Let's <laughs> turn. You just flip it. Yeah. Okay. We'll go back. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Fat fingers again. So this it, is the Champlain House. Yeah. That's uh that's the building that was present up until two years ago, and uh, it actually looked quite a bit uh, similar to what it did then, except for the uh, the paint. Um, it was painted yellow, and I, I think uh, back in the old days they had a, a porch on the side of the house or on the front. Um, again, that shows a flood down Main Street, and uh, the uh, it was April 1911, and, and water was uh, flowing uh, all the way down Main Street, and supposedly in that time period, you could uh, float a barge down Main Street <laughs> wow. during those floods. Wow, but that building stayed yeah. until when now? Uh, just uh, two years ago. Yeah. You've been there, Calvin? Yeah. Yeah, lots of Yeah, okay, here we go. <laughs> 
Now we the, got it. Now the we next got one the is St. Mary's Church. Um, St. Mary's Church, I believe, was actually built around 1886. And uh, that's the church that you see here. And uh, um, I have several photos of the church. And the photos um, show the, the church at different time periods. And uh, um, the, uh, some with the Champlain Monument, some without. The Champlain Monument was put there in 1907. And this particular photo was actually shown, um, uh, shows the monument not to be there. And there's a stone addition on the side that's present now that's not present in this photo too. So this is one of the earliest photos I have of St. Mary's. St. Mary's Church. Yeah. Right. Um, the next photo is the uh, Plenty Moore House. It's actually 1881 that this picture was taken. And it shows the McClellan family. And what's interesting, uh, there's a lot of things about this house. It shows Malcolm and uh, Hugh McClellan. Uh, Malcolm would be my great-grandfather. Um, uh, Hugh McClellan, who collected the material. Charles, who was actually uh, friends with Abraham Lincoln uh, in Springfield, Illinois. And no la kidding. later became uh, probably one of the biggest Lincoln collectors of memorabilia um, in the early 1900s. And he ended up selling his collection to John D. Rockefeller. Or oh, actually, wow. he did, and his sons did um, after he died. And that collection is called the McClellan Collection. It's at Brown University. So a lot of people may not know it, but one of the biggest uh, collections of Lincoln material in the nation were actually housed in the back cottage in a, in a large safe that was uh, installed in the back. And But anyway, these this, this is a picture of the house, 1881, probably right after the McClellans bought it. Um, they bought it from Plenty Moore's grandson, um, and uh, uh, Charles McClellan's wife was uh, probably the great-great-granddaughter of Plenty Moore. So, you know, it was always in the family. Uh, the trees that it showed, that, I, that you can see in these pictures, um, were actually, uh, you can still see the, uh, even though this is an 1881 photograph, the stumps of the trees are still present today. So it's, it's amazing to see the trees, you know, the presence of the trees still here, you know, 100 years from later. Oh, that's great. All right. Um, the next picture is uh, July, I think, 2003, and it shows the uh, uh, Champlain Academy. The Academy, um, so uh, the next photo is the Champlain Academy, and it shows what's interesting about the Academy is um, it, it was built in the 1830s, and uh, there used to be the first, the first school that was put in Champlain that was considered a, a real school um, was, uh, I think, built in, in the 1820s. Uh, Plenty Moore Jr. gave the land to the, uh, to the village, and they built a school, and I think, in 1829. That school burned down, and then another school was built in 1838 and was present until 1887. And uh, that school uh, was considered the first academy, or the second academy in Clinton County after, uh, after, uh, after Plattsburgh. That building burned down, and uh, a new building was built 1889. That's what this picture is. It shows the, uh, the, the schoolhouse probably in the early 1900s. Um, that school burned down in, on December 16, 1940. And the, uh, I guess it would be Champlain High School, uh, was uh, was built in its place, and that is where the older uh, elementary school is today, and uh, that that was closed down a few years ago. Uh, actually, Hugh McClellan was the architect. He was an architect uh, for many years. He actually did the Champlain monuments in Crown Point and, and Plattsburgh, and he did a lot of projects around uh, this area too, and he did the. Uh, the Rogers Point School and the uh, and this and the school building that's present next to the uh, Champlain Memorial Library. Oh, great! Okay. Next, the next one uh, shows Main Street looking east. Uh, it shows a wagon in the uh, in a dirt covered road and Village Hall, which was before that the Presbyterian Church, and uh, that Presbyterian Church was built 1849. Wow. And uh, the building is actually still present today, even though it's, it, it was converted in the 1920s to the Village Hall. And uh, it shows a very tree-covered uh, tree uh, uh, Main Street. 
And, you know, again, it's a street that you don't see today with all the trees gone. It's beautiful. I love the trees. Yes. Okay, next. Uh, this next one is a really nice photograph. Um, it shows, um, it's probably taken around 1900, so it shows the Elm Street Bridge. And it shows a lot of things that aren't present today. Um, from on the far left, it shows a building that used to be a, a, a Plenty Moore Junior store, probably in the 1860s. It was a bowling alley, it was a gas station. Um, you can see the uh, um, Champlain house in the distance on the other side of the road. You can see uh, the bridge, which is not the same bridge, obviously, that's here today. It's a lot bigger. Um, the two uh, Champlain uh, Hall buildings, are, which are present today, are still are in this photograph. Um, the old bank building, First National Bank, which was built 1880, is shown, but it only has one story. And what's interesting about that was, obviously, the building's still present today. Selene Paquette is uh, working to restore it right now. And it has two stories. And 1905, uh, Hugh McClellan, the architect, um, added a second story onto the building. And uh, uh, that was the brick building. And years later, it was uh, the library. Uh, Hugh's brother, Malcolm, was the librarian there for many years. Um, to the right of that building there is a smaller house. And you can only see it on the edge. Mm -hmm. And that building was removed in 1910 and it's an empty lot there and I think a lot of people would be surprised that a, a house actually was in the space between the Knights of Columbus Hall and the uh, First National Bank. That's neat. I love it. Great old pictures. All right, what's this um, The next house is present. It's on uh, Oak and Maple Streets. Uh, it, it's changed over the years. But it still has the porches. The, the building's been restored recently. Uh, in 1869, it was called the P.F. Dunning House. Uh, it's a Venetian villa house. The same architect that built that house also built the house across the street from it um, that looks similar, has this, that Venetian villa, the little cap on the top of the roof. Great old homes, and it's, it's good when they do survive, isn't it? Yeah, and it's really nice when people um, buy these houses and restore them and try to bring them back to their That's original That's wonderful. Condition. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. The, the next house is the Timothy Hoyle House, which is the corner of Oak Wait Chestnut. Wait a minute. Did I, I turn too many? Yep, there's one more. Uh, oh, I, I did. October. Oh, all right. Here yeah. we go. Which one? That's this yes. one. Yep. The Sheridan Ironworks House um, building. The, the picture here was taken uh, 1898, circa 1898, and it shows uh, the original Sheridan Ironworks factory. Um, and there's several photos I have the, of the house, of the building. And uh, believe it or not, these buildings were built in the 1850s, 1860s, and they're present today. I mean, a lot of things have changed at the Sheridan, you know, which is the Kimpax place now. And, uh, um, the, the original buildings are still present today, which is quite amazing to see that. They build them to last. Yeah. And that's and not a bad that thing. That's, that's great. All right. Um, the next uh, picture is the uh, Timothy Hoyle House, corner of Oak and Chestnut Streets, in circa 1900. And uh, I know the Kaufmans live there now. And the house really has changed very, very little over the years. Uh, if you look at it today, it's almost identical to what it was in 1900, except for the, uh, the uh, iron fence around the building. Um, it was built by Timothy Hoyle. Uh, he was the first uh, mayor of Champlain, 1873. And uh, you know he had a lot of uh, uh, farms and business ventures, and it was quite well. He was actually a Plenty Moore, had married a Plenty Moore relative. Oh. Um, probably, I guess it was Plenty's, Plenty Moore's uh, um, granddaughter, one of his granddaughters, and uh, you know, he was. Uh, it was also on the site of the uh, First Presbyterian Church that burned down in 1844, which we'll get into a little bit later in, in another calendar. Um, so that's that's that house. That's a good one. And for what I did at the end of the calendar, this was my first calendar. Was I had three pages left, so I wrote a short history of Champlain. I won't go into all the detail except to say that, as I said earlier, Plenty Moore had fought in the Revolutionary War, 
received the land grant for 11,600 acres, which was basically the village of Champlain, came up with uh, several people uh, a couple times and laid out the 119 lots of 100 acres each and settled it. And by 1789, he and several people were up here permanently. And uh, he, again, was first judge, postmaster, etc. And his house was actually used quite a bit during the War of 1812. All the uh, generals of the armies, both armies, Americans and British, uh, Prevost, who's well known for the Battle of Plattsburgh, was at the house. Um, and 1860s, uh, Benson Lossing made a drawing of the house, which is on, in this picture here. And, uh, you know, it shows the house what it used to look like. Um, so what I did was I just finished up with a uh, short um, summary of the founding That's of Champlain. That's great. Plain. That's wonderful. And that first calendar was rather successful. You yeah, I printed 250 um, and sold almost 250. I only have a few extras left. <laughs> So it That's did quite great. well, yes. That's wonderful. So you decided, let's do it again. So I said, let's do it again. And, uh, 2004. 2004. And for the 2004 ones, what I decided to do was, it was really after the fire of the Savoy, I added a page, uh, which added really four pages to the back of the book. And I was able to put a, a larger, uh, you know, number of pictures in. That's great, that first picture. Yeah. Now, the first picture shows the first national bank of uh, Champlain. And it's the bank that you see today with the second story. Yeah. And this was probably taken, uh, uh, I think, after it was obviously after 1905, um, between 1905, 1907, or 1910. It actually shows this small house on the side of it with, between the... Knights in Columbus and the bank, which was removed in 1910. And again, a lot of people may not realize that there was even a building there. And it shows the bridge, the uh, uh, metal bridge, which is not present today. You know, the, the beauty of it is I can just picture people watching this program saying, hey, Mabel, did you know there was a little building there one yeah. time? That, you know, so I mean, it's, it's a really little, great. It's a, it's a small parking lot and on and just an yeah. empty lot. Um, the next picture shows again uh main street it's a snow covered picture uh and uh it shows a number of different buildings a lot of the buildings aren't present today um and the uh the elm, elm trees it's a really nice uh shot a lot of winter shots thank goodness yeah. people had cameras out in the winter time yeah. huh it was not easy you know taking pictures then obviously um the next photo shows uh two two people standing uh once you know, again, in, look in at the snow. snow. And it's actually taken uh, where the Champlain Hall buildings are uh, looking east. And again, it's about three feet of snow, and they're wow. standing on the snow mound. Three feet of snow and a heck of a blow. Okay. Now, the next one is uh, shows the uh, uh, flood on, uh, on Main Street. And it's... Uh, it's again one of those annual floods back, you know, years ago, where Main Street was flooded, and you can actually see a canoe floating down Main Street in front, <laughs> of, in front of Champlain House, and there's a lot of water around, uh, you know. The we bridge. saw a lot of those in New Orleans, didn't we? <laughs> yeah, it was. Yeah. It was uh, they're quite, fishing for their boots, maybe. <laughs> yeah, it was a, a lot of water here, and oh, you can see boy. the townspeople on the bridge looking at this, uh, the flooding. And those those annual floods were not. We're laughing now in retrospect, but they're no fun at all when you live along the river and you knew it was almost always going to happen. Fortunately, yeah. some of these things have changed now and we don't have the floods as often. Yeah. And a lot of floods seem to occur, you know, toward the end of March, early April. Yeah. And, uh, which is, you know, is what happens now, but it's under more control yeah. today. Okay, next. The next one is uh, River Street again. It's what I showed in the 2003 one. Uh, another view, and it basically shows April 1911 of huge ice jams um, between uh, houses. And if this is actually looking toward the Knights of Columbus building in the back. Powerful force. Of Powerful force. Huge. You can see light posts uh, have been uh, knocked down. Yeah. And, you know, there's a lot of damage to the buildings. I have other photographs of this flood that actually shows a lot of damage to the buildings. Oh, wow. The next one, uh, I call it the McRae Crest House. Uh, that's a house up on Oak Street. And uh, 
It's uh, an example of Italian palazzo design. It was built in the 1860s by the same person who built the house I showed you in the 2003 photograph. Uh, yeah. um, and uh, uh, it's called a Venetian villa house and has a lot of uh, fine uh, woodwork. Uh, what's interesting about this picture is that it shows a front porch that's not present today. The front porch now is actually wraps around to the side. Um, but this is a, it's a quite different front porch. And it was called the Chateau Lawn House in the early 1900s uh -huh. for some reason. Okay. Um, and the next picture is the Pliny Moore House, circa 1881. And what's interesting about, it's the same, probably taken at the same time as the picture I showed um, earlier, and of the McClellans, the, the four McClellan uh, members are on the steps. And what's interesting is it shows a white uh, fence. And th again, this is 1881. Uh, there's a picture, uh, a painting in the Clinton County Historical Association of the Plenty Moore House showing the same fence that was done in 1829. So that fence was, uh, you know, probably the same one. Uh, Charles McClellan took down the fence um, and replaced it with a stone wall. And that's what people today driving by the Clark Funeral Home will see a stone wall that goes around the whole property. That was built uh, between 1881 and 1900. I don't know the exact date. Mm -hmm. um, the house here in these pictures is not the house that you see standing today. That house burned down 1912 and was re rebuilt by the McClellans uh, to the same specifications. Uh, what's interesting was Hugh McClellan was an architect and as a, for a college project he had measured the entire house in probably the 1890s and had blueprints which are all at special collections now at, in Plattsburgh. And, uh, he, uh, um, you know, all the blueprints were there, all the exact measurements were there, and when the house burned down, they had all that information, so they were able to Isn't build that it neat? to the same spec. Oh, that's great. Yeah, and so it, that's why it looks similar to what it is yeah. in oh, the old I, pictures. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, the next one shows the old Champlain Railroad Station, and uh, um, it, that building's not present today. I heard it burned down some years ago. Um, it was on the corner of Chestnut Street and I think Butternut Street, and you know that's where the railroad passed the Ogdensburg uh, and Lake Champlain Railroad, later called the Rutland Railroad, and that went uh, that the railroad tracks passed uh, through Prospect over Elm St or Oak Street and West, out west, and that this is where the railroad station was. And that, again, that building's not there. It's nice to see some of the old stations being restored yeah. and preserved. Rouse's Point and, Rouse's and Point others. Is trying to do that. Morris Junction. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's great. All right. The next one is uh, called Island Park. It's the island um, in the Chazy River, right behind the Knights of Columbus building. And uh, believe it or not, I guess it's I've seen some written histories about the island. It had been used in the early 1900s. By 1806, it was used for baptisms and for re religious services. No kidding. And uh, it was very popular then. It was, you know, these pictures show a very, very nice park. It had a pavilion and a uh, bandstand and a fountain were there. And uh, at some time later, uh, a bridge was uh, built up behind the uh, Knights of Columbus to the island. And all that's gone right now that I think it's it's not really being used anymore, but at some time it was used. I know Noah Dyer Moore, for example, uh, used to give speeches in the 1840s or 1850s um, on the island, too. Oh, that's great. That's good stuff. Um, the next one is uh, the, uh, it's called, it's the uh, uh, John and Geraldine Rose House, uh, and it was actually built on the land where the uh, the old cemetery used to be, Champlain Cemetery was all called the old burying yard, and plenty more and all the uh, um, a lot of Champlain re residents were buried there. He gave that land to the village in 1799 to establish the cemetery, and uh, um, after I think one after the first person in Champlain to die, you know, in 1799, and. Uh, it was used many years by uh, different, you know, for bearing. And uh, 1812 or 1814, uh, one of the soldiers, uh, Forsyth, was shot in, in Canada and uh, he, he was buried in the, on this land. And uh, in the 1860s, when Glenwood Cemetery was established, everyone was dug up. All the graves were dug up 
and moved to the new cemetery, uh, Plenty Moore's grave and everyone else's grave, and but they couldn't find Forsythe's grave because he was buried in an unmarked uh, grave. Oh. And so he's someplace on this property. Um, in the 1880s, uh, this house was built, and in the early 1900s, uh, um, uh, Oscar Breedenberg built the, uh, lived in the house for about 40 or 50 years, and he sold it to the to the Rose who live there right now, and uh, they have a very nice house. It's it's changed a little bit over the years. Um, there's a front porch that's been enclosed. That was a uh, for a uh, um, there was a Dr. Hackett who used to own the house in the early 1900s. He had a son who had TB, and in those days they felt that being outdoors, exposed to the air, was good for patients. And he built what was called a curing room and enclosed the front porch. And uh, that's what we have today. Uh -huh. Interesting. All right. Um, the next picture shows uh, Elm Street uh, looking toward the, uh, the Savoy, um, what used to be the Savoy. And the building to the right is not present today. That burned down, I think, in the 1930s. Mm -hmm. Again, it shows a uh, dirt road and shows the, uh, the stone wall that Charles McClellan uh, had built up. That's where the Clark funeral home was. Okay. Uh, the next picture is actually very nice. It shows uh, Main Street looking east on the Elm Street Bridge, toward, or from the Elm Street Bridge. And it's looking up toward the uh, the telephone company, and again it shows a dirt road, it shows uh, horses and carts, etc. And uh, it's a very nostalgic photo. It's beautiful. Yeah. And th just goes to show people how wide the main thoroughfares were back. Yeah, in yeah, those days. very They good. were dirt, but they were very wide. Yeah. Um, the last house is the Royal Corbin Moore House. Uh, it's where the Garrig family lives today, and. You may not recognize this picture at all, but it's the same house. Um, 1905, um, Hugh McClellan, the architect, um, built a wraparound porch on the house, and which has large pillars today. And at some point, maybe at the same time, a uh, an addition was put in the back where the Harrisons had a had a, a library, and that's the house that you see today. Um, but if you look at this picture here, uh, you would never even realize it's the same house. Just built around yeah. it as they did. Huh? And they have uh, steps to get on the carriage in front of the uh, house oh. too, which is what Isn't we were talking great? about before. But then you did history. So. Yeah. So this was the first year I decided to expand my histor historical section. I was prompted by the uh, Savoy Hotel fire, where I wanted to write a larger history and get the pictures out. And because I realized that I was after the fire, I was talking to a lot of people, and they always remembered it as the Savoy, but. I was pretty sure that not many people knew what was present before that, you know, why why the house was built, who lived there, and uh, so I went into detail of uh, of the house, and it was built 1851 by Bartlett Nye, who uh, uh, also married one of Plenty Moore's, uh, you know, uh, descendants, and he was a merchant landowner owner and uh, uh, very, very prominent in Champlain. Uh, he built this huge mansion. Um, and uh, um, you know, lived there, lived there for some years. He actually died a few years after it was built, but his wife and children lived there for another 50 years. Um, he had a lot of about five surviving children. Um, my grandmother's grandmother is, is the first daughter of his, and oh, yeah. that's how I'm related to him. Sure. And uh, but he had a grand estate on the property. Um, uh, with you know some uh, different houses and gardens and stuff, and uh, it was it was very magnificent house with a large uh, uh, driveway in the front, and that driveway was even present you know when the Savoy was built too. Oh, no kidding! Um, so I went into detail about the house, and you know the house was part of the Nye family's house until the early 1930s. By that time. Um, Many of the children, or all the children, had died. Then the it would be the uh, um, the children of Bartlett and I had died. And then it would be the grandchildren that were living there, and, and they moved. They ended up moving to a smaller house on Oak Street, and uh, so the house was really abandoned in the late 20s to early 30s. And uh, I think the Thompsons bought the house and did a major renovation of it and converted it into a hotel. It was called the Savoy Hotel from the mid 30s until. Uh, um, probably the um, 1960s or so, early 70s, and um, 
the, the, the uh, uh, went through several owners. Uh, um, the Racines owned it, and then the Demars bought the place in the uh, in '68 and converted it to apartments. And uh, where it was apartments, you know, when the fire burned down, when the house and, was burned and down. What a shame! Huh? Yeah, it was. What it was really sad to see that. What a shame! So I put in a lot of pictures um, of of the Savoy, you know, or of the. Uh, it was called the Lo uh, uh, Nye Mansion on Locust Hill. Uh, it was on Locust Hill because Bartlett Nye in 1850s had planted a lot of locust trees on the hill. And it shows what the house used to look like with the gardens on all sides and the, the bird baths. Uh, the first photo is from 1876, uh, and a lot of the other photos are around 1900, 1906. And, you know, it shows the nyes in the property. And uh, what was interesting, too, one of the things I, I saw before was there was a signature wall on the, on the front of the house. And I call it the signature wall. And all the Nye and McClellan families, uh, rel uh, relatives, had placed their initials with the uh, their date, the date. That Come they wrote on! It. And How it often survived. do you see that? I don't think I've ever seen it, that it, before. It went from the 1860s to, uh, uh, you know, the 1940s. Wow. Yeah. And, you that's know, not a common practice, is it? Yeah. And in, in this one picture, it shows uh, E.R. Nye. That's uh, Ellen Rose Nye. Oh, back on that. Yeah. Let me show that again because May, I'm, not, I'm May, not sure people realized what that was, yeah. right? May 13th, 1871. Under my hand. And uh, so there was probably about 50, um, 50, I counted at least 57 names on it. You know, the McClellans, Hugh and Wood, uh, Malcolm McClellan. Um, and a lot of their cousins. They just wrote on it? Yeah, different times from the 1860s, late 60s, 1880s, a lot of 1880s, 1900s, um, et cetera. You know, they'd sit out on the front porch and write their names. And all through the time of the Savoy, we had people walking in and out of the front door, you know, one never really bothered, you know, with that. You know, it survived. That? I actually tried getting the bricks when it was demolished, um, but when it was under 10 feet of brick, it was, I couldn't. Couldn't find them. <laughs> oh, and so, and what a shame! What yeah. it would have been nice to preserve yeah. that as a wall, wouldn't it? Somewhere? Yeah, I, I'd actually wanted to try to save these bricks and 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 you know try to salvage them, but it was. I came up several times and tried a couple times. Uh, again, it was the wall had actually been demolished, and it was there was no way you could find them. So yeah. they're buried under you know in the basement now of the Savoy. <laughs> Very interesting. Yeah. So uh, that's uh, the 2004 calendar. Um, that's that's real neat. We're going to yeah. go into 2005 and 2006 in yep. just a moment. Stay tuned. Well, we were taking a breather just then. We were just talking a little bit about how many times plenty more came. To yeah, the he came country. up. Uh, he came up to Champlain uh, technically three times, and then the fourth time he came up here and then settled permanently. The first time he came up was just to see the land, see out where it was and what the make of the land was. The second time he came up, uh, he laid out 119 lots. I think the first time was 1785, then it was like an 86, 87. Uh, third time he came up with five or six other people um, and started to build a sawmill, log cabins, etc. His log, first log cabin, his first house was actually where the uh, um, Elm Street Bridge is today, you know, probably where River Street is uh, or where the bank is. That's what is written down. Um, the fourth time he came up was uh, um, 1789 uh, after the, the, you know, the town, uh, the county and the town had been established by the uh, legislature and uh, he brought his uh, wife and his oldest son, which was, would be my ancestor. And uh, he's actually the first person born in Champlain is Ann Moore and she was born a year after they came up. That's wonderful history. All right. She the one who married Hubble? Yes, she oh, married uh, she married Julius Caesar Hubble and the Hubbles of Shay Z are all related to uh to uh plenty more too. All right. Distant man. relatives. They tie everything's hooked together there. Yeah. You just have to find the connections. She's the one who made the bet with yeah. the yeah, uh, during oh, the War yeah. of 1812, she scolded the uh, English <laughs> officers yeah. saying that they were going to be defeated. And, uh, um, you know, they said, well, you know, 
uh, if we're defeated, we'll throw our purses at you on their way back. And sure enough, that's what they did. They had gold and silver, and that. that's an old uh, Hubble family, you know, tradition. Or story, story. Yeah. It's wonderful. Great stories. Yeah. All right. Now we're 2005, the current year. Yeah, 2005 um, was interesting because what I did with that one was I started to add uh, additional photographs. And so I'll talk about the cover first here and the cover shows again the first national bank of champlain taken probably from the balcony of the champlain house which burned down a few years ago and it shows the uh, building before the second story was added in 1905 and it shows the other building next to it and it shows uh um you know horse-drawn sled and people walking across the bridge and it's, it's a very, beautiful scene isn't it's a beautiful it? scene it's, it's really a, it's an nice awesome scene, scene. And, it. you know, a lot of people would obviously recognize it because a lot of people probably drive it you know, on a daily basis. Yeah, it's changed a lot. That's great. Um, the next picture, again, shows Champlain Hall. Um, it shows the Angel Store and the Spellman Store. And it was um, there was a number of different stores in these buildings. Uh, again, you also have the A&P and the Grand Union in the buildings and the Masons upstairs. Uh, these buildings were built probably around 1850, um, and uh, they've had a lot of history. I know the, the Nyes owned the buildings, too, in the early 1900s. Um, if you can also hold up maybe the whole calendar. Oh, so you can see yeah. the bottom, yeah. The bottom, you can see in, the, in this one, and I did it in the 2006, was I started to add pictures at the, on each side of the month that I knew I'd probably never use for a main subject. Very clever. And because I had all these pictures, I wanted to get that information out there. So I usually would choose uh, a scene from the same, uh, from the same, uh, um, of the same scene. And uh, here it shows the uh, uh, A&P food stores and the, uh, uh, another view of this building. Champlain it's Park. always a, a flood or a snowstorm or, yeah. <laughs> amazing. Um, the next picture Coming shows up. the, uh, this is a, has a quite interesting uh, um, history. This is the Knights of Columbus uh, building. And if you look at it right now in this picture here, you'll say, you'll, you'll be surprised that it's the same building that's standing today, but it is. Um, this has a, a interesting history, which I'll get into um, a little bit later in the back, but uh, uh, it's changed quite a bit throughout the years. Um, it was uh, built by the Presbyterians in 1844 uh, after their church was uh, torched by an arsonist. And uh, it was used as a, as a church for a couple years and then it was sold to the Nyes. And uh, um, then the uh, Hugh McClellan had his Marshall Press in the basement and it was used as a Lyceum Theater from 1914 mm -hmm. to 1948. And uh, then in the mid-50s, the Knights of Columbus uh, um, bought the building and rented out the basement to the, to the McClellan's lifetime, uh, lifetime rent. And that's, they continued the press up until the early 80s. And in the 1960s, um, the, uh, uh, an addition was added onto it, which is like the lounge, cocktail lounge, and the parking lot was filled in. Um, I should say the building in this picture here, it's not doesn't look like the building that was built in 1844. 1910, Hugh McClellan, the architect, um, did a total restoration of the building, put a new brick facade on it, um, put a new front on it, uh, new windows, uh, and basically changed it. And I have a little history about that building uh, in the back of my calendar. Oh, that's terrific. Um, the next picture shows uh, Main Street. And probably a lot of people um, may remember some of these buildings, um, but I think they were all, they burned down in the late 50s or early 60s. And it's basically where uh, Paquette Park is today. And it, had, it was called the W.C. LaFountain Building. Um, he had a um, store there, the Bon, um, the, uh, you know, Albert Kaya's Groceries, off to the side, he had a dentist named Stevenson there, and again, it shows a flood. And this picture was probably taken in the early 1900s. Mm, okay. Uh, the next one is the Champlain Hall buildings. Um, it shows uh, 
the, again, the April 1911 flood, which a lot of pictures have been taken of this flood. It was probably one of the worst floods um, Champlain has seen in a while. And uh, shows a lot of uh, water and ice, you know, around the buildings. And uh, uh, at this time, it was a five and ten cent department store was in these buildings. You can see that on the sign. The pic, the, the quality of this uh, print is excellent. It's again one of the glass plate negatives that I had I printed, it? and fabulous. it looks like the picture was taken yesterday. It does. Yeah. Just wonderful. Yep. Uh, again, here's uh, St. Mary's Church. And this picture was actually taken prior to 1907 um, because of the uh, Champlain Monument. It's not there. And at this time, from the previous uh, calendar I showed you, it has a, uh, a stone addition that was uh, placed onto the side of it. Um, so again, another, another photo of St. Mary's. Uh -huh. uh, another photograph of the, uh, will be the Clark Funeral Home now, but it's the Pliny Moore House, 1881 and uh, from another angle and actually shows a small gazebo off to the side of it and uh, that the stone foundation is still present today uh, and you know this picture was taken in 1881. No kidding. Oh cool. Uh, nice nostalgic it. view of Main Street with uh, two ladies. Uh, Isn't with that beautiful? Umbrellas, yeah. That was taken in front of Champlain Hall, the buildings that are still present today had a um, wooden front, wooden porch or sidewalk, and you can see horse-drawn carriages driving by in a in a uh, um, you know a place to rope horses. Uh, again, a very nostalgic scene of, of old Champlain. Yeah, that's really nice. Um, this house is the Hackett family house on Main Street, and it's where the St. Mary's uh, School is today. And the other photographs of the insets I have below, which is hard to see, they're um, from postcards. Uh, what's interesting was this stone building that's there today, the school, was built onto the back of this wooden house. And uh, it was used as a convent and uh, St. Mary's Academy. And then at some point, the, the, the wooden house was torn down. And all that remains now is the, uh, the academy. And that, again, is across from the uh, Champlain Telephone Company. Oh, yeah. Most interesting. Oh, here's a neat one. Yeah, the next one is uh, Doolittle's uh, store on Main Street, the interior. And um, again, it shows a view of what, you know, life was probably around 1900, what was sold. You can see, looks like to be golf clubs or, some, or uh, uh, um, umbrellas probably of some sort and a lot of clothes and... and uh, I like the stovepipe. Look at the stovepipe stove pipes, all yeah. the way up and crossing. <laughs> That's great. You know, we found at the Clinton County Historical Museum thousands of old photographs yeah. and showing the insides of businesses and stores and so on because the liquor authority came and took a picture of the outside of your place and the inside, and those were all turned over to the Clinton County Historical Museum. They Once again, they were going to be flushed, yeah. and somebody said, no, we'll take those yeah. and, and try and, to and define again, what they were. Pictures they, are worth a thousand words oh and, my and a goodness. lot of... You can get a lot of detail of what life used to Just be. Just absolutely. Um, the next house uh, is uh, is up on Main Street uh, today, and it looks very similar to what it used to be. Looks like that's built to last forever, yeah, doesn't it? It was. It was used as a, uh, uh, I guess it was uh, a nunnery at some point and uh, um, a convent. Uh, and uh, a lot of people have owned the house: Charlotte King, uh, John B. Richards and who was a member of the Champlain Canal Boat family. And uh, it's owned by St. Mary's Parish right now. It's solid. Yeah. It's solid. You can tell by looking and at it. It hasn't changed a lot over the years. Oh, here's it? a house we mentioned before, but yeah. isn't it a great um, house? This is George Vischer Hoyle's house. That house is still present today. Um, it's up on Prospect Street, um, pretty close to Allen Racine's house, almost across from it. Uh, George Vischer Hoyle was very prominent in Champlain. Uh, he was president of the First National Bank, uh, which is the bank that uh, Celine Piquet, the building that Celine Piquet is uh, restoring right now. And uh, he was the president of that, and he also worked for the railroad at some point. And uh, um, he'd actually married, uh, a, a, um, you know, or was relative to the Hoyles. Uh, of who lived in Cham in uh, in Lacole, 
and uh, he he uh, had a lot of influence in Champlain, and he built this house here, and it's it's been it looks almost as similar to what it did today. Great looking houses, I love it. I love them. The next one is again uh, Sheridan Ironworks, and it's circa 1898, and uh, it shows the back view of the uh, building, and it shows railroad tracks. These three buildings that you see here in this picture are still present today. Um, yeah. And I went into a little detail about the Sheridan Ironworks and the different buildings that um, that you know have have been on that property. And what's interesting about the Sheridan Ironworks is the the history of it goes back to 1847, and several people had a small foundry, which was at Cedar Street, where the Elm Street bridges and Main Street, and that burned down uh, around that time. And uh, 1854, they built a second foundry at the site of the Sheridan, and some of those buildings are still present today. And they built, um, um, you know, a couple 40 by 80 foot buildings, and that's what you see. And it's went through a lot of different owners. Uh, in 1887, it was owned. It was bought by T.W. and C.B. Sheridan of New York City, and it was named the Sheridan Ironworks. Um, and this is where the Breedenbergs come in because oh. the Breedenbergs, who a lot of people in Champlain will know of the name, um, one of the Alfred Breedenberg, um, who was Swedish, I believe, came up, was working in New York City for Sheridan. He came up here, and. Uh, it was actually, uh, and he worked there, and uh, he brought up some of his cousins and stuff too. And uh, Oscar Brinenberg, who uh, a lot of people will remember, uh, he owned what was the the row house up on uh, Oak Street. Um, he was manager for you know 40, 50 years at the Sheridan, and other you know place. It's been used by the Harris Graphics uh, and now the Kim Kimpex. Wow. So it's changed quite a bit. I have a lot of different photographs of the uh, of this uh, building. It's a huge part of the area's history, yeah. that's for sure. I've actually been told that some of the uh, pictures of the pulleys and stuff are still, you know, in, in the smaller insets are still present today. You can see it in, in the ceiling of the, uh, in the foundry. Then you did even more history. Yeah, so in this one here, I started to write a history of uh, four different buildings and how they related to... Uh, um, uh, the uh, burning of the uh, Presbyterian Church. And oh. I think a lot of people in Champlain will have no idea of, of really how these buildings relate. Yeah. And there used to be a Presbyterian Church on Oak Street, and it's where the Kaufman House is today, mm -hmm. on the corner of Oak and Chestnut Streets. And um, 1844, a guy named Charles LePage burned the Presbyterian Church down. And he did that as a basically a test of his incendiary device to try to burn down the Montreal courthouse because he had a friend who was in court for smuggling and he felt that if he burned the evidence he could get his friend out of jail. So he actually burned I think several houses or buildings is what people say. So he burned down this building here which was unused so they, it was immediately suspicious because it had been unoccupied for a while. And he burned that down and the Presbyterians had no place to worship. So they built what was the uh, Session House, which is the, now the Knights of Columbus building. They built that um, in 1844, used that for a couple of years. And when they, started built, when they built the Session House, they started building the, uh, their main church on the corner of uh, main and Church Street, which is where the, the old Village Hall building is today. It's the same building. Um, what was interesting, they were going to build a church where the Champlain House is, or was, which is at the base of Elm Street, but a lot of townspeople didn't think a church should be built right in the center of town, even though it's, you know, a couple hundred feet away. And a swap of land was made, and they built the, uh, the, the hotel, the Champlain House at the base, which is what people I was showing pictures of, and built the church at the corner. That church was built 1849, and... Uh, uh, was used, was present until 1927. 1927, the the church burned down, and uh, um, Hugh McClellan, the architect, um, from the ruins of the church, uh, built what was the village hall, and that was opened in eight, 
1929. And it's, it's the same building, the top roof and the steeple have been replaced, but you can still see the old brick. Um, so hmm. that's, that's one, one place. Uh, when the, uh, the church burned down, uh, a lot was opened up, and Timothy Hoyle uh, bought the, uh, the land, and he built his house uh, around 1845, 1846. And uh, that's the house that's present today. The Kaufmans live there. And uh, there's obviously no, no uh, indication that a church was present. I, I've seen a picture, uh, a map, about showing the church. And so Timothy Hoyle lived there. Um, he died 1886. And then it passed to the Whites and probably some other people. Um, I mentioned again about the Session House. The Session House is the Knights of Columbus Hall today. And when the Presbyterians sold their the Session House, they sold it to uh, the Nyes, who rented it out for a number of years. And and uh, then because the Nyes owned it, it went to Elizabeth Nye, Hugh, which was Hugh and Malcolm's mother. And um, he, they, he restored it in 1909, 1910, and he also did a smaller restoration earlier. And it's been used by a lot of different people, a lot of different functions, Lyceum Theater, uh, stores, custom house, uh, shops, or, or an artist shop, etc. And of course the Morrisville Press was in the back. Yeah. And here's another, um, some more pictures of the Lyceum, shows the Kennedys. Uh, Bill Kennedy and his family. Uh, uh, and it, uh, I mentioned a little history of the Lyceum too. In 1929, month-long renovation of the Lyceum uh, increased the seating capacity to 200, 235 people. You know, in, in the uh, Knights of Columbus building, and it was able to show talkies you know, for the first time. Mm. And uh, yeah, so there's a lot of information, you know, about the the old building. And then I went into detail, as I mentioned, about the Presbyterian Church and uh, then the, the old Village Hall that was there. And, of course, there's an historical plaque in front of Village Hall, the old Village Hall, oh, yeah. that's still present today. And I, I show um, some pictures of that, of the 1938 um, dedication of it. Really? 150th anniversary of Champlain. And that shows uh, Hugh McClellan was the architect, uh, design the plaque and it shows Pliny Moore's name with the Ashmans and the Southwicks. South, Southwicks are uh, living on Oak Street, Dr. Southwick, and they were all uh, descendants of the first settlers to come up with Pliny Moore. And the last page. That was, that's the last. That's the page, last page. Yeah. Yep. And you know, before we get into the final calendar, I want to mention that these calendars are available to people. What's the easiest way for somebody to get one if um, they see this and want one? Yeah, there's, there's, I've expanded my uh, pl place, places where they're, they're sold. And uh, um, they're sold at the town and village offices. They're sold at the uh, Celine uh, Piquet's Insurance Agency and uh, at Kinney Drugs and uh, Champlain Memorial Library. Uh, the Cornerstone Bookstore in Plattsburgh and the, uh, oh, the Cornerstone, yes, the Cornerstone uh, Gift Store in Rouses Point. Um, they're selling the newer calendars now. If you want older calendars, uh, I would go to Paquette Insurance Agency in Champlain, and uh, they have older calendars. I should say I still have uh, 2004, 2005 still available, um, and. Uh, and uh, they're they're still easily obtained. And I know a lot of people have bought. I sell actually about half my calendar as well after the uh, the new year. People don't buy them for people the people want the collection. Yeah, people don't buy them for the calendar. They buy them for the sure. pictures and the history. And so you know, even if you know five years from now, they're still I think going to be selling. And the interesting part to me is that you're doing most of this by yourself. Yeah. The uh, Every, I, I go through the pictures, I pick out pictures, um, I, I write the history. Um, Celine Paquette's helped me a lot with, uh, you know, her knowledge of Champlain and uh, giving me advice and, you know, where what buildings are called today and who lives there and, and a little sometimes little histories of, of buildings. Um, but I usually, I go through the pictures, pick out the pictures, write the captions and choose the historical subjects and write that. And it's a, it's, you know, it's a, 
two or three month uh, process. Uh, it's not easy doing it, and so it takes a lot of time. It's magnificent. It's, I love the cover yeah. on the 2006 calendar. I've seen this picture before. Isn't that a classic? Yeah, look at the cop standing right in the middle. Yeah, it's 2006. Uh, again, it's changed a little bit. I added the uh, um, on, on the title page a historic essay, Champlain and the War of 1812. The picture shows. Um, Main Street looking uh, east from the Elm Street Bridge, and again it shows a police officer. It says, Caution, the sign says, Caution, use Village of Champlain, use Texaco. <laughs> Don't you love it? Uh, uh, a little this, advertising right yeah. in the middle of the street. I, you can see cars in this picture, but I think the streets are still dirt. Covered. Yeah, they sure are. Yeah. And that's a beautiful shot. I love it. All right, let's move right through it. The uh, next photograph. Uh, shows uh, another view of the bank building before 1905, taken from Champlain Hall buildings in the in the back, and it shows the the old bowling alley that some people may recognize or remember. It's not there now. Um, the the bank has a second story, and then you have the the Plenty More House that's in the background and an old bridge. It's another winter scene. Yeah, those are great. Uh, another winter scene for a winter month um, shows another nostalgic photograph uh, taken December 25th, 1901 in front of the McClellan residence, and it shows a horse-drawn carriage driving down Main Street. Uh, Champlain Academy is in the background. Oh, that's those cutters, aren't those beautiful sleigh? Huh? You yeah. can almost hear the sleigh bells. I love it. And again, at this time, none of the streets are paved, and no. you can see the dirt in the sure. road. Um, another flood. Um, this is uh, around 1904, and it shows a lot of ice, uh, and it's starting to uh, go onto River Street around the houses that were present back then. It shows Champlain Academy. This picture was actually taken uh, from Main Street. Oh boy, what, what a mess. Oh, <laughs> high water, huh? Yeah, another April 1911 uh, photograph shows uh, Champlain House. Um, and it shows basically water going up to the doorstep of the uh, of the house, and it shows a carriage, and it's another another flood scene. People who live on high ground have no idea, yeah. do they? Huh? Boy, it's great great memory. Some of them not too nice. All right. Yeah. Next one shows uh, the first communion class, St. Mary's. It was probably um, 1907, 1908. Um, I, don't, I don't really know exact date, and it shows uh, a lot of young people standing in front of St. Mary's uh, Church. Are these glass plates, you think? Yeah, these are taken from glass plates. Uh, you can see the quality is still exceptional. And Just amazing quality. I, I know someone, I was talking to someone, an uh, older gentleman, and uh, he thought his father was standing in the background. That's <laughs> so the I, beauty, I gotta, beauty of I these find photographs. That people... People know, they've had connections, you yeah. know? All right. Um, the next photo is the gazebo. It's called the Plenty Moore Summer House. Uh, and this picture was taken September 1896. And it shows a, uh, this gazebo was likely built 1801 by Plenty Moore when he built the main house. Uh, that's what the references I have uh, indicate. And the, this summer house is still present now on the Clark Funeral Home property. And, uh, you can see it's it's still survived, you know, over 200 years, and there's a lot of history to it. Um, you probably had War of 1812 soldiers sitting or camping in in the house. Um, Does it look essentially the same? Essentially the same. Probably about 80 percent of the wood is still present today. Wow. Um, I'm working to try to get that this uh, building restored, and it's a, another project that we'll see where that. Bless you that for works. doing yeah. all these things, David. It's just um, fantastic. I love it. The next picture shows the uh, um, it's a shows a couple people Charles McClellan, Peter Cardin, Hugh McClellan, and Charles Eaton. Great character study. Uh, huh? Look good, at the faces. Yeah, I will say for this calendar and maybe even last year's calendar, I try to put more people pictures, you know, into the calendar and and not focus completely on street scenes and house scenes. And well, they're this, camping, huh? This was a good picture. Look at the Argyle yeah. socks. And, the and it's a, July of 1898. <laughs> You've got to love it. Um, as I said, Charles McClellan was actually uh, friends of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, Lincoln knew him well back in, in the Springfield days. Um, Hugh McClellan, we've talked about quite a bit. He's third from uh, left. 
Peter Cardin uh, was a, a very good friend of the McClellans. Uh, I worked on some farms and stuff. Uh, and so I went into a little detail about uh, Charles McClellan and, the, and, the McC and, and Hugh and Woody Mc or Malcolm McClellan. Little camping with your good shirts on and your starched collars and your and your yeah. and your cuffs isn't yeah. that amazing? Camping 1898 style. Oh lordy! Again, I, I in this photo here, I tried to focus on uh, you know fam you know people scenes, and it shows a farm family in Champlain, and uh, uh, probably they're showing a lot of their possessions. Uh, you, they probably have their daughters or granddaughters on the on the roof. And if you look at it in close detail, you can see it's a log cabin uh, with probably uh, a metal roof um, or, I don't know, metal or wood. Um, they have a wagon in front, and it shows the probably the husband and the wife and a couple ladies, and then it looks like probably the children are in the back. Mm -mm -mm. Great. That's a great shot. I love it. The next photo is uh, St. John's Episcopal Church in Champlain. People may know it now as the Presbyterian Church. It's still present. It looks about the same as it is today, uh, corner of Oak and Chestnut Streets. Uh, interestingly, Oak Street was never called Oak Street. It was called Moore Street in the early 1900s. It was called the uh, um, Montreal Stage Road. Uh, it was called Canada Street, and it was a lot of different names for it. But Montreal eventually, Stage Road, huh? Yeah, Montreal Old Stage Road. And then Chestnut Street was uh, called Matilda Street uh, in honor of uh, Plenty Moore's daughter. And at some point it was changed to uh, Chestnut, Chestnut Street. Uh, I should say Moore Street in Champlain, which is on the other side of town, is named after Noah Dyer Moore, who was Plenty's, uh, Plenty's uh, son. He's my, my relative. And it was named after Noah Dyer because he was one of the first people to work to incorporate the village uh, in the 1840s, 1850s. Uh, but this here shows St. John's Episcopal Church. Uh, there used to be a wooden structure there, you know, in the 1869 map of Champlain that burned down um, 1904, and the St. John's uh, congregation built a stone church in its place. I actually, in this photo here, in the inset photo, I actually have a picture of the older wooden church. It was a Gothic-style church. And uh, then I have a picture of the new church, too. Mm, beautiful. Oh, here's the, a motley crew of kids. Yeah, huh? the next photo shows, again, a lot of children and probably a one-room schoolhouse. Uh, again, I was trying to focus more on people and, and less on uh, structures in this calendar. And you know life, how people lived in the early 1900s, and this is probably taking late 1800s to 1905, and uh, you know shows a lot of different children all in the same schoolhouse. Uh, uh, at least three children aren't, don't have uh, shoes on. You know, in those days, oh, you know people may have walked that. to school in their bare feet. Isn't that amazing? And then the button top shoes. And, yeah. Oh my. Um, a, here's a good one. This is we were talking about this picture very this early on. It shows uh, probably a late November, early December scene, and it looks very, very cold and uh, doesn't look like to be a lot of heating, you know, on in this car here. It's an old car. It's the picture is actually taken on Maple Street in front of the uh, the building that's still present today. There's an old barn in the back, and today it's you know part of it's collapsed. The roof is collapsed. Oh my. Um, the last photo is the uh, Venetian Villa House in Champlain. It's on Main Street, um, down the road a little bit um, uh, from Route, Route 11. And that house basically has changed very little over the years. It's, it's, pr it's been, I think siding's been added to it, white siding, but it's basically maintained its shape. That's great. So this year I, I decided to do work on uh, the War of 1812. And it, this is a subject that a lot of people in Champlain may ha not really know much about. There's a lot of talk about um, the Battle of Plattsburgh, and that's what a lot of people in this area probably know the War of 1812 from. Um, but a lot of these events uh, that happened about in Plattsburgh, um, a lot of the troops that were there present were obviously camped in Champlain too. So what I did was I wanted to figure out what happened in Champlain and who was there and when. And when I did that, I started realizing that 
a lot of stuff happened, and probably Champlain saw more activity than any other uh, village in Clinton County. And uh, so I went in through a lot of material through the internet, uh, through the book War of 1812 by Alan Everest, who actually draw, drew on a lot of the Plenty More papers at the collection. And uh, um, I tried to make a timeline of what happened in, the, uh, in Champlain. And what emerged was something quite amazing. Uh, and I'll just go into a little bit of sure. detail as to what, what happened. Um, uh, War of 1812 started in, on June 18th, 1812, um, and it was started with with England uh, after a lot of several years of building tensions. We almost went to war in 1807, and it was called the War Scare. So the war was declared. Um, you know, the the British were just on the other side of the border. So uh, Champlain was occupied by uh, four different American armies and. Then, of course, the British in 1814. Now, November of 1812, Henry Dearborn came up to uh, Champlain with about three to 4,000 men, maybe up to five, and uh, camped in Plenty Moore's orchards. And uh, then went up, was, his goal was to try to attack Montreal and conquer Canada, you know, in the Montreal. And he got up to uh, La Colle and got turned back. And so, because it was the end of November, uh, he basically ended his winter campaign then, and they, the troops would go into winter quarters. Troops re really in that time did not fight in the winter because of how cold it was. They were, they were camped out in tents outside, so a lot of people would uh, not survive the winter. And uh, so during that occupation, Plenty Moore's uh, um, house, which is the house that we see, you know, the copy of it, see at the Clark Funeral Home, uh, was used as a headquarters. And he wrote to John Jacob Astor, who was, I guess the, he's the first millionaire in the America, fur trader, New York City from New York City. He goes, uh, sorry, I did not write but here last November. My house was like a large hotel. All the principal officers of the army were in it, and I did not write. So I went into a little bit of detail about that. Um, 1813, the winter of 1813, um, not a lot happened in Champlain. There was some people stationed there, but it really, uh, nothing really happened. What started happening was in May of 1813, and uh, we had a lot of times militia coming into into uh, Champlain to protect the border. These were not federal troops. These were. Uh, um, you know, either Vermont militia or New York State militia, they were basically volunteers, um, and they had very limited supplies. You know, they were usually farmers that were called out whenever a, a situation arose. And these these guys came in May of 1813, and uh, they came in, uh, um, you know, the two boats called the Growler and the Eagle, and unfortunately, these guys were uh, captured by the British in an ambush, and the two boats were used uh, a year later in Murray's raid and uh, by the British on Plattsburgh, which is what Pike's Contonement was uh, burned at that time. Mm -hmm. um, so then I go into June of 1813, Davis's occupation of Champlain. He was another uh, person, uh, Colonel Samuel Davis came to Champlain, uh, and Benjamin Moores of Plattsburgh uh, had sent a letter to Colonel Isaac Clark in Burlington, that's where the command was at the time, saying we need more protection. And, uh, you know, the uh, problem was these troops would be here a month and then they leave, and then the British would come down uh, a few days later, dry, ride around in, on their horses, and then the Indians would come down, and a lot of people here felt rather defenseless um, at the mercy of the troops, and plenty more actually wrote a number of letters over the years, and one time he wrote, we the Committee of Safety of the town take liberty to represent to you that in our opinion, if this post is abandoned by the troops, the inhabitants will very probably not have time or means to make their escape, but must lie at the mercy. Um, yesterday, a party of seven Indians fired on a soldier within a half mile of one of the blockhouses. That's probably where Dewey's Tavern was. And others were in uh, uh, people's houses. And he said, today a party of the British in uniform appeared in sight of the picket about a mile from the blockhouse. And they have reason to believe they have intelligence of the march of troops that they will be immediately upon us. So 
what's interesting was General Hampton, who was in Plattsburgh, wrote a letter back to Plenty Moore um, saying, basically, if you choose to live on the border, you got to meet the consequences. And he goes, um, I'll read just part of it. Um, you ought not to extend, forget the extent of the American lines that a nation engaged in an offensive war is sometimes constrained to direct all its forces to one point. The measures necessary to such an effort can strike you. It ought to further occur to you that those citizens whose choice has placed so near the balance of the territory they inhabit ought to be prepared to meet the consequences incident to their local residents, and they ought to unite their strength for the purpose. Mm -hmm. So he basically said, you're there, you know, you should protect yep. yourself, and you choose to live there. Um, August of 1813 was Murray's raid, and Murray was a, uh, a colonel in the British uh, Army, and he, his order was to destroy the uh, public buildings, military stores, and vessels. And he sailed down uh, in, the, in the Eagle and the Growler, you know, the two American boats that were captured, uh, went to Alberg, Swanton, Burlington, and Plattsburgh, and he burned down the uh, Pikes Cantonment. And uh, he went to Shazy, burned down Sachs' uh, uh, store. Uh, store that was there. And uh, Matthew Sachs wrote to Plenty Moore, uh, he wrote, I, but at this moment heard that there was a plan to burn the public property at Swanton and Champlain, both today. I think that there is no doubt you will have a visit from them before tomorrow night. Probably a visit <laughs> they were hoping to see. I think you had better remove the public property from your village and tear down the blockhouses. And uh, sure enough, the next day, the soldiers uh, rode up the Shazy River and burned down the uh, blockhouses. So that's... That was in August of 1813. September 1813, another general, Hampton, uh, American general, uh, camped at Dewey's Tavern, which is uh, the home of Louis Bedard, mm -hmm. and with about 4,000 troops, and his plan was to go up into Canada and again camp conquer Montreal, and he didn't get make it uh, past La Colle <laughs> and got, basically got turned back. And, uh, and during, during this, uh, all this uh, work, I went through Plenty Moore's diary. He kept a diary, and he wrote, you know, countermarched, and he wrote, uh, the army passed into Ottletown battle. So his diary's been very good to confirm dates. Sometimes dates that you see in books and on the internet are just wrong. Wrong, plain yeah. wrong, yeah. Yeah. Uh, probably the most interesting thing I, I found was Major Parole's threat to Champlain residents. And apparently around Dewey's Tavern, where the 276 border is, uh, some American militia fired on a picket guard over the border, uh, British, and the parole got very upset about that, and he and he sent uh, a threat to Plenty Moore that was printed, you know, nationally, and he says, uh, he goes, citizens of Champlain, I'm happy that humanity should still have so much power over me as to inform you that should any of the militia of Champlain be found hovering this side of the line. I will let loose upon your village inhabitants the Canadian Indian force under my command. You are probably aware that it has been with greatest difficulty I have now withheld them, but your cowardly attack at midnight of a small picket of ours has torn us under the veil which hid you from them, so beware. <laughs> wow. And then he wrote, P.S. Major Perrault would be obliged to the Honorable Judge Moore to acquaint the citizens of Champlain of the tenor of the above humane advertisement. Yeah, humane advertisement yeah, is right. So so what was interesting was there was no more raids on this side of the border, you know, uh, on, on the New York side. However, Colonel Clark on the Burlington side did exactly the same type of raids in Missiscoy Bay. And he stole, uh, he burned barns, stole horses, and, and basically claiming it was uh, public property, even though a lot of it was private. And this infuriated Perot, and so he basically when it was about a thousand soldiers uh, came into Champlain, pillaged the stores, you know, pickpock, you know, there were people were pickpocketed, uh, the stores were ransacked, etc. And uh, it happened over a couple of days. And I won't read the whole letter, but Plenty More wrote a uh, very uh, scathing letter to General Thomas Parker, who was in Plattsburgh, uh, saying uh, this predatory warfare can't persist. And uh, I'll just read just very slightly. He says, This predatory warfare, if persisted in, will desolate all the frontiers on both sides without affecting anything valuable or honorable 
in the war if if it is gratifying advice not to say revenge at the expense of the peace and comforts and perhaps the lives of those citizens to protect it and, uh, and he's complaining about the militia being called out all the time he said the militia, militia called out and harassed at the public expense and nothing by these done to accomplish any valuable object um, and uh, so he went into detail about that and then another guy he's Ezra Thurber of Rouse's Point agreed with plenty more and because he was going to be taken back as a prisoner at one point and he said can it accomplish any good on the general scale of national affairs that fact is us that lives on this frontier must pay for it retaliation is determined by the enemy so what he's basically saying is the Americans and the British are fighting this war and uh, the, at this point the Americans are going out and pillaging the the British side and the British did it to the Americans and there wasn't really any military significance to that you know there wasn't any reason to do all that it was uh, and the, the citizens were of course paying the price for being so close to the frontier um, so turning the page now March of 1814 Wilkinson General Wilkinson was uh, uh, occupying uh, um, Champlain too and he had about four to five thousand troops and uh, came in March and again his, his uh, goal was to attack Montreal and and unfortunately they made it to La Cole Mill and that mill was heavily fortified a number of troops were killed and wounded and, and Wilkinson returned back to Champlain two days later and remained for a week um, June of 1814 Forsyth who was buried in, on the property of the old bearing yard I mentioned earlier um, he, with some, 70 of his riflemen, went into Canada for a small raid and um, was in a fight and uh, got, got shot and killed and died in the Plenty Moore house. So in retaliation, the, uh, the Americans uh, went over the border and went looking for uh, the Captain Mayo. And uh, Mayo was in charge of 150 Canadians and Indians and uh, he was shot and taken back to the Pliny Moore house and then the British were surgeons were allowed to come over the lines and treat him but he died about eight days later so there was a lot of battle and actually Pliny Moore was good friends with Mayo because Mayo had uh, taken some clothes over the lines to Pliny's son who was still in Montreal going to school so he wasn't allowed to do it but you know he gave the clothes to Mayo who was allowed because he was British um, so July and August 1814 was another occupation that was the uh, the fourth American occupation of Champlain and Izzard had about 4,500 troops camped uh, where Pine Street is today overlooking St. Mary's on the big hill and he was there for a while and all this time he was beginning to realize that uh, the British were building up right over the border and no one really knew what was happening um, Late August, uh, Izzard was told to abandon um, Champlain and march to Sackett's Harbor on, uh, in western New York. And by this time, he knew Prevost had about 10 to 14,000 soldiers camped uh, just over the border. And he said, any hour we we're expecting an attack. Well, he delayed his, he delayed his uh, departure of Champlain to try to get word to the Secretary of War in Washington, but the he the war uh, the secretary didn't get this information and he was forced to leave you know otherwise you'd you know be in trouble so the day after Izzard left the uh, Indians and then the British started coming into Champlain and uh, then uh, the British army of about 10,000 soldiers came in and and came down in two wings and camped uh, at, at Dewey's Tavern and some other places and uh, and uh, a couple of days they were camped for a few days and then on um, around September 5th they started their march down to uh, Chazy and then Plattsburgh and of course we had the Battle of Plattsburgh and that was the big battle you know that a lot of people remember you know the War of 1812 from and from the uh, naval battle itself yeah the naval battle yeah. uh, and uh, you know that evening Prevost made the decision or that day Prevost made the decision to abandon Plattsburgh and that was a very controversial decision because he would have won the, the land battle if he chose to fight 
uh, the Americans were outnumbered dramatically. And uh, he chose not to stay, marched back that night, uh, camped in Champlain, and then went back up into Canada. Um, and uh, so I wrote about that. I also wrote a little bit about the Dewey's Tavern. That's nice. I'll just show a picture of that on the back here. It's the home of Louis Bedard today. And uh, You see Louis every now and again. He's such a cool guy, yeah. and he's really interested in the history of his place. And what what's in, a lot of people don't realize is um, there was four prisoner of war treaties that were negotiated yes. throughout the whole war, and two of them were negotiated at this house and by the British and the Americans because the problem was both sides had way too many prisoners, you know, from different skirmishes, you know, all over, you know, from Louisiana to Lake Ontario to here. And they, were, they didn't want to take care of all these people. So they, uh, they had two prisoner war treaties that were signed, although none of them were ratified by Congress, they were still adhered to. And uh, so, you know, there was a lot of history to this house, this particular house that's standing today is the 1800 house that was uh, standing during the War of 1812. So, and, and you know, if you look inside it, it's very similar. You can see the old molding that's present today, and, and it's a lot of history to it. After 205 years? Yeah. Pretty good, huh? Yeah. So that's that's uh, this year's calendar, and uh, that just came out about a week ago. Uh, in well, mid again, November. we're recording this on November 29th on a blustery day. Yeah. And we really appreciate you driving all the way over from Vermont to be with us today. And, yeah, thank you. And the braving the elements and so on. But you are to be tremendously commended for these efforts. Yeah. I know it's how satisfying it is with you. But it's nice also to, to be acknowledged for what you've done because you've done, this is a, this is a marathon effort. Yeah. And I say marathon because you're, you're, your distance hasn't been run yet. You're gonna. <laughs> I, yeah. I imagine when you go home, you'll be playing around with pictures tonight, won't you? Probably, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of a uh, lot of pictures out there, and uh, um, always looking for more pictures, especially pictures that were of Champlain taken in the 1860s, 1870s. I, I don't have many of those, and I've I've seen a few around, and and uh, um, but I don't see a lot that were taken that that far back. A lot How of the can people contact you if they if they've got information you might be able to use? What's um, the best way? Probably the best way uh, you, you can email me um, and that'll be uh, DASP DASP at hotmail.com um, that's twice and you can yeah. that's probably the easiest way to contact me and uh, you know if you have any pictures that are like really really old uh, that would be nice to see. You know, we've said it once and we'll say it again. People have these things. They have their own little dresser drawer archives yeah. and attic yeah. archives and basement archives. And they'll stick a photograph in an old family Bible and all of a sudden they'll discover it, not realizing yeah. that this stuff is historically significant. Yeah. And, you know, there's not many pictures I've seen of Champlain that were taken in the 1860s, 1870s. Uh, I mean, I have pictures of the Nye relatives that were taken in the 1840s, believe it or not, um, late 40s. I mean, photography this was just photography really had just yep. started, uh, you know, to be around in the mid mid 1840s, early 1850s, and uh, I, I've actually seen pictures of my relatives, um, you know, taken in 1845, 1848, um, real pictures, you know, photo pictures. Um, but there's not really a lot out there showing Champlain from, uh, you know, 1860 to 1880s. And, so that's uh, a nice gap you'd like yeah, to Yeah, that's that. a gap. And, of course, you know, before that you had drawings and paintings. And supposedly in the 1938 celebration there was one of the oldest paintings of Champlain out there. And someone had. I don't know who it was, but it was made mention to it. You don't know where it is now? No, I don't know. It was someone's relative probably has it now. But... Uh, this is 1938, so it's an old painting, and uh, there's of course the painting of the Plenty Moore House, 1829. It's in the Clinton County Historical Association, yeah. and that's a it's a watercolor, and that's a really nice painting too. So you still have a few loose ends. Yeah, and you know I'll probably do an, uh, another calendar next year, um, maybe focusing on the uh, maybe the founding of Champlain. Uh, you know, it could change, but if I write about that, I'm going to go into Plenty Moore's journal. He kept a journal uh, of the surveys, and uh, I have some aerial photographs I have 
where I've superimposed the uh, the the land, you know, the lots of land that he laid out, and this showed you. And three years ago, a lot of the boundaries still are present today. You know, farmland boundaries, as tree lines, etc. Uh, so I may go into more detail about that. Uh, one of the things I really want to find out is why Champlain's called Champlain. It used to be called Morrisfield on the River Chez or just plain Morrisfield, in in honor of plenty more. And at some point it was chained to Champlain. And uh, it'd be interesting to find out why that is. I mean, I know for example, Moores is named after General Benjamin Moores of Plattsburgh, who actually owned all. A lot of the land not to be confused in Moors, with, yeah, with plenty that's M O O E R S yes. versus M O R E, and uh, the st uh, Moors was actually in the state legislature, and they named it at, in honor of him, that 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 land or you know that town, the village. Um, so you know it's a lot of different subjects. I got a lot of material, and you know a lot of photographs. So I'll I'll probably continue on, you know, depending on how these calendars do, but. Again, they're you know I'm printing 300 out and you know selling most of them, so they're doing pretty well. That's wonderful. Yeah. Again, our personal congratulations, Calvin and I. Very interested in the history of this area and the rest of Clinton County, and you've done a yeah. magnificent job over the years. We know you'll be back yeah. to do another one, and we'll probably sit at this table, Lord willing, and if the creek doesn't rise. Yeah another time to talk more okay we like great. we like what goes on in your head david patrick thank you have a wonderful holiday period thank and you. have a great life and stay in touch if you make any good discoveries okay you? thank you and who knows where we're going to be next time for our little corner